Welcome to the Embracing Brokenness podcast, where our goal is to engage with all of those willing to venture deeper into their transformational journey with Christ. Here's your host and co-founder of Embracing Brokenness Ministries, Steve Adams. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Embracing Brokenness podcast. And we're glad you could be here. It is a brand new year, one that's filled with anticipation as we look back on 2020. You know, they say hindsight is 2020. I think we're glad that 2020 is now hindsight. But I want to talk to you about something today that is vital for almost any Christian to really engage in a personal relationship with the Lord and in community with each other. And it's safe people. How do we define safe people? Now, I will play for you a clip that my wife recorded during a training or a teaching that we do called Identity Matters, and it's done here locally on a number of levels. But we talk about safe people, safe community, and she uses an analogy of a glass ball. And I'll let her explain that in more detail. But as you consider the characteristics or the traits of a safe person, one of the things that's really important to do is to look at our Heavenly Father and and look at Jesus. He's the one who demonstrated the safest of all traits and how he treated our fellow man, the disciples, anybody he came in contact with, people that he healed, that he took care of, that he cared for, uh, even the people that persecuted him the most, he loved. That's not an easy assignment. And until we can really understand how to bring that type of person into our life and be able to communicate and freely be able to give of ourselves in a relationship where trust and faith and confidence is the the linchpin of that relationship, we really won't understand, even in our own healing journey, what has taken place and the changes that are required in each of us to really get our head around this brokenness that we've experienced as part of our life here on this planet. So safe people, very critical to our healing journey, how we assimilate, how we associate, who we trust, who can share our stories and become part of our lives in a significant way. So I just want you to listen in and hear what Colleen has to say in this segment that we recorded earlier in 2020. Let me take a story and tell you um, how the place of safe people became a reality in my life. So my first husband, when I met him, um, we were best friends for a couple of years. I met him at IBM and um, we went out to dinner one night and he was a new Christian of a couple years. Of course, I was senior Christian because I've been a Christian for so many years. Years have nothing to do with spiritual maturity. And quite frankly, I have learned more from people who met the Lord yesterday sometimes than people who have been around the Lord for 50 years. Now, there are people who have walked in a, the, in a journey with God for 50 years that are like amazing. They look like angels when God has transformed them before he takes them to heaven. So I, I'm not undermining that. But sometimes we think, because we've done it longer, and I I was just really arrogant, so I thought I'd done it longer and I was better and knew more. But there is a passion for people who really know what they were saved from that I didn't have because I was raised in a Christian home. And so um, because of the sexual abuse I had endured, and I felt like, I mean, it was like a lot of different people outside my home, but it was crazy. Um, I just felt like I was a play toy for men. And so men became very, very unsafe for me. You know, of course, I have a dad who is a authoritarian, never listened to anything. He was the dictator ruler, and everybody was going to listen to what he said. Um, good brothers, but, you know, they would, you know, for, to get me to cook pancakes, I got beat up in the morning until I was willing to say yes. So, you know, they were brothers. So it's not that they were totally unsafe, but I eventually was like, people weren't safe. And the more abuse I had, I would start putting these bricks in a wall around myself to protect myself. And eventually, um, I didn't like women a whole lot better than I like men. I'm not sure I would say. I thought women were catty and cliches and didn't listen and about their own thing. But men were just downright scary. So I engaged with a lot of relationships with men. 
And I did it by basically putting a ring in their nose and dragging them around. If I could control you, if I could abuse you first, that's who I was. Talk about wounding from the, my woundedness, wounding other people. I wounded a lot of people because it was all just a big control game, but it never get deep game. So I meet my first husband, two years, he's two years into Christianity. He goes, who is this girl at IBM who like looks really different? Because that was pretty interesting, highly sexualized culture, very party culture back in the day. Um, I mean, sexual harassment was just the flavor of every day. It was horrific before a lot of the laws came into effect. And so I really was like, I, want, I mean, I kind of did my job, didn't talk to people, because um, I thought it was pretty disgusting. And he observed me for a while. And eventually he's like, I want to get to know you because you're really different. What drives you? And I said, unabashedly, I'm a Christian. I don't get into this crap. This is not okay. And we got to know each other at a surface level for a while. And then one night we went out to dinner. And here's what happens at the end of dinner. He says, you know, I want to have a talk with you. He said, I've been watching you for a while. And he said, I believe that um, you are really, really hurt and you don't trust people. And he said, and I'm here to tell you that until you start trusting, like you, your Christian life is tanked. This two year old Christian. Your Christian life is tanked. You are never going to get all of God's best for you. And it's just not the way to live. And I'm wondering what caused you to go inside yourself. And he shared a story about a glass ball, which stays with me and I usually use in this class. And he said, you know, he said, um, Colleen, he said, I believe we're all born with a little glass ball inside of ourselves. And that little glass ball contains the most precious, precious, precious parts of who we are. Okay? Our secrets. I think now in different language, it's our real true self. It's all our vulnerabilities. It's our past. It's the things that if anybody used them wrongly, you know, would really, really hurt us. And he said, and so those things are contained. And he said, when you're a child and you're innocent, Okay. You actually go up to the first person, maybe it's you know in kindergarten on the playground, you go to one of the girls and you say, oh, here's my glass ball, and you hand it off going, okay, that person can handle it. And you're playing and your friend's playing, and the next thing you know, they accidentally drop that glass ball on the ground. And you look and you pick up all the pieces and you glue the glass ball back together, and you're like, man, that hurt. Somebody didn't protect all that was precious to me. Okay. And then it gets better because now you're in second grade and you're chasing around, you know, the cute boy or the cute girl on the playgrounds. And you finally go over to him and go, here's my glass ball. And you hand it to him. Okay. And in guy context, context this is what guys do because, you know, being a girl, I watch the guy side of this. The guy is like, he's, you're kind of cute and I'm flirting and whatever, what you do in second grade because you don't even know what you're doing. And he takes your glass ball, but then his buddies go, did you really take her glass ball? Like, you really, like, you got something going on? Oh, no. Bam! And he slams your glass ball against the wall to prove that well, he's not interested in you, okay? And now you're really hurt. And you pick up all the pieces of your glass ball, and you put it back inside, and you're like, man, that really hurt. And you go on and on in life going more and more protecting. Your handoff comes. At some point, you get to the place where Steve's hands are out mine, and I'm kind of holding my glass ball going, is he trustworthy? Can I let the glass ball go? And finally, slowly, I let him have it. And there is a last person in all of our lives before we go into complete isolation that has hurt us with our glass ball, and we eventually put the final brick in the wall in my thing where I said, nobody is ever getting that glass ball again. I can do surface relationships, but nobody's getting that stuff right? And my healing journey meant I had to trust somebody. And what Bob was telling me, can you trust? Are you willing to trust ever again? Now, the funny part about that was I was almost engaged at that time, not to Bob, and I would never have given. He's a really nice guy and could be very different. I mean, this is many, many years ago, but I would never have trusted him telling my glass ball. But he was the nice Christian Mennonite boy who, you know, my parents would approve him, whatever, and was going to make a good income, and we'd have little Mennonite children, whatever. Like, it just was like that made sense to me. But I never would have trusted him. And it made me think about, holy cow, like, do I really want to be in life where I can't share at that deep level? But I don't trust anybody, right? And so my journey, um, the interesting part I'll give you kind of, Bob and I would be, were best friends for a number of years, later got married, um, and... 
he knew. He knew all the details within the glass ball. When he relapsed to alcohol, um, he became pretty hostile to me, even after he came back from rehab. And he took every one of those precious things and on a regular basis used them against me. So he knew I was hurt by certain things from my father. So when I would walk into the house from work, I would hear, you know what, you're exactly what your father said you were, you're blah, 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 okay? And so it became hostile, and it was really painful. Now, I'm grateful that he did it because it forced me into a healing journey that actually is probably a big part of some of the things that we're doing here at Water Street today. It's definitely a part of our ministry because my reaction to the pain of being hurt and I question the reaction. When I see some of you guys, guys do it more than girls. We got a lot of girls actually that can go off. When I see somebody just go off, like in this crazy rage anger, oftentimes if somebody's gotten too close to that glass ball or they've hurt you or you're afraid they're gonna see the poser inside of you and blam, it goes off, okay? So the, the healing that comes when you go, okay, there's something going on, when, when Bob used to say to me things from that special place when I walk in the house, I said at Water Street, if you guys would ever see a video clip, and my response, first of all, I slung curse words together. I don't even know if they all exist today. Um, there were a lot of them. I said them that if, like, in a way that if I had a knife, I'd probably be stabbing him, although I never felt like stabbing somebody, but it was just that kind of anger. And I would go to church because I was running the prayer teams at the time good Christian girl running the prayer teams, and I would go and I would say, you guys probably need somebody else to run the prayer teams because I think I'm demon-possessed. And they'd be like, what? I'm like, I don't know what's happening, but this rage is coming out at me because Bob is doing these things, and I'm just raging. And they're like, well, Colleen, do you want to be healed? And I'm like, do I want to be healed? Like, did you just hear what I told you my husband said? Like, he's the one with the problem. He needs to be healed. Colleen, do you want to get well? Colleen, do you want to be well? You're like, you guys are crazy. Like, I just told you. Like, if somebody wants to come fix him, fine. I'd go off, go home. Another week would go by. Demon-possessed woman would be all over the house, acting crazy. I'd go to church. I can't do this. This is not, like, I'm, something's really, really wrong with me. In the way I'm responding, somebody's got to fix him. Colleen, do you want to be well? I'm not the one with the wellness problem. I got a husband problem. Is somebody going to fix him? Colleen, do you want to be well? Are you going to pick up your mat and be well? And I was like... This is nuts. You people are nuts because, like, I'm telling you what a jerk he is and what he's using to give, how nasty he's being. I'm not a nasty person. Yeah, well, Colleen, you're the one who's raging and saying you should be off the prayer team. We're just saying that's a sign that you need some healing. Well, I don't know what I need to be healed from. I'd go back home next week. It took me about three times for the conversation you want to be well. And then I was so angry. I'm like, of course I don't want to act like a raving lunatic. Like, this isn't, this doesn't feel good to be in it. And they told me about a journey, which, of course, I did not go well into the journey of healing, but it's the journey we're inviting you guys into here of going down really deep for God to ask Jesus to kind of meet you in places to restore trust, to restore community, to restore identity, to right-size who he is. Um, interesting, as I engage my healing journey, I would come back into the house after I would do healing sessions and... Um, my husband would push the same buttons, exact same things he would throw at me. And at first I was like, I just need to excuse myself and go change clothes, I'm tired. So I'd go change clothes or whatever. And then eventually I'd come into the house and when we would start, I'd bust up laughing. I'd be like, you keep going with that and see how well that works. And, and he would be like puzzled. You know, and then, and well, no, I, I actually in the beginning said, get behind me, Satan, you're not getting me. Then he thought I called him Satan. That did not go well. But eventually I would start to laugh and I would just sit down and go, this is hilarious. Like, you can't do this to me anymore. God has healed me. He has a journey to heal you if you're really willing to engage it. And you can't do this anymore. But what did he have to use against me? The most precious, precious, precious things. So... Was Bob safe? He was at one point. Later on, he wasn't. Were a lot of people in my life safe? No, they weren't. Did I treat people as safe who were not safe? I absolutely did. They helped me build a wall. And I actually continued to choose people to keep that wall up to prove time and time again in small ways they were unsafe. The journey for me to finally start to trust was a journey to pick some people and say, what in the world does safety look like? Who, what are the characteristics? of people who I can trust, like with this really deep stuff. 
This was another episode of the Embracing Brokenness podcast. For more information on Embracing Brokenness Ministries or to subscribe to our blog, podcast, YouTube channel, or engage with us on social media, please visit our website at embracingbrokenness.org. Thanks for joining us.